here enabling continued oppression of women in socio-cultural <laughs> aspects and you could argue it's right against the Millennium Development Goals for instance. Absolutely. You could argue that it's, a, it's, it's actually reifying existing constraints. <coughs> so you're kind of enforcing mm -hmm. inequality in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're staying at home anyway, you're actually giving them access to the maths curriculum or whatever so that they can keep up and maybe get through the year and whatever. I think it also speaks to sort of this kind of apolitical um, work that's being done in the field and probably often by people that don't take into account perspectives of people that have been marginalized. So I would, so one of your key research questions could be, yeah, how, how to sort of take those perspectives into account. And, do and maybe, you know, um, if GSMA was really concerned about helping those girls, they might actually give them moon cups or something that will allow them to go to school rather than ICT. But anyway, you know, maybe they'd be the both. You get the app and you get the <laughs> <laughs> um, The point is, is that you, you're absolutely right, is that a lot of the ICT for D stuff is presented outside of any political context, out of any cultural context, out of any economic context too sometimes. Um, so um, what I'm going to think about today is how some of these fabulous things that people are doing, not necessarily that one, but others, um, how these link to some of our core um, development um, research questions. And then as I said, I'm going to go back to um, this ICT ecosystem, which um, for me links the uh, ICT um, issues with the development issues through a political economy framework. So. Um, I'm going to be arguing somewhere, if we get to them on these things, that methodologically, um, if you are going to call yourself a development theorist or practitioner, you have to um, adopt some kind of uh, collective approach. So if you're drawing on um, the individualism that accompanies um, traditional um, liberal democratic kind of uh, process and things, you're not going to um, come up with conclusions. You're going to come up with these kind of single solutions for single people, but you're not going to change. To actually change and, for, and transform, if you understand by development the transformation that was mentioned, um, the reduction of, of, of uh, inequality and the you know, aspirations towards social justice, then you actually have to understand what you're doing in relation to the institutions that are there. The social, as we spoke about in this case, the political and the economic institutions are there. If we want to make sure that everybody has the access um, that Jonathan was appealing for, then we have to we have to deal with the state and markets and the relationships between states and markets. We have to deal with regulatory regimes. We have to deal, that is what practically makes development happen or not, that we get progress or not. So I'm going to come back to those because I think um, that's been written, I've written about that, other people have written about that quite a bit. Um, but um, we can always come back to it if we, we, we um, need to another time, whereas we haven't really had a chance to explore some of this. So my first question was, you know, is, is development really a discipline? Or is it actually just, you know, a, any of our other traditional social sciences? Um, because I think what I, I, what I, what I tend to get, you know, it's very easy for those of us who um, were, did our, our training in um, the social sciences or, or the humanities, because development is part of any program, whether it's called that or not, it's actually what you study. But for people who come out of sciences and engineering and computer science and that, unless they're very fortunate to be in a, a program that offers them a development component, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not part of your toolkit automatically. And that's why I think when we have these conferences and that people get up and again and again and again and they talk about ICT solutions, but there's no connection with development. And then I think there's a serious question, as I said, I think it's um, a, a more interesting one to me now, but I think there's a serious question about whether there is actually a discipline of ICT for D, or whether it's actually, you know, um, an integrated social sciences kind of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, approach that you use in order to look at particular um, problems. So the question then, and 
I think there's been some interesting literature that I'm, what, what I'm going to be touching on, and I'll actually put his reference somewhere so that you can look at it, is a very useful book um, by Brett called Reconstructing Development. Yeah, Reconstructing Development. Um, but he basically charts the you know, long, kind of fabulous history of, de of, of development, which I'll try and do very quickly now. Um, but then says, essentially, if it's going to be a discipline, then we need to be able to subject the theoretical and empirical assertions um, of these competing factions that we see in ict for d that we mentioned earlier to systematic <coughs> rational inquiry to establish truth claims of these competing paradigms. So what are the main paradigms that we see in, in development theory, historically? Let me go back a bit. Essentially, what you get in um, development theory is the, f the early development theory, and I'm only talking about a century ago, um, the early development theory, uh, people were essentially, people who kind of produced modernization theory as we know it today, okay? And essentially modernization theory um, drew on Western liberal practice, um, and in some cases in terms of um, uh, communist um, uh, development for regions outside of, uh, of communist areas, you get a similar kind of approach, but that's in a very particular kind of literature. Mainly modernization theory said, um, what we'll do is we'll help countries transform from these agrarian societies into industrial societies by um, uh, improving them, industrializing them, and basically you would get this trickle-down effect. So you would start at the top and you would try and improve things. And Basically, the institutions had to change, the political institutions, the economic institutions, you have to liberalize markets, you have to get democracy, and eventually it will all, they'll be moved along much more quickly. Um, then you've got the um, uh, uh, responses to that in terms of structuralism or corporatism, which were kind of responses that said, no, the market actually can't do this all on its own. And from both a right and a left wing perspective, you've got people who said, the state needs to do more. The state has to um, drive um, development. So, um, so then, you basically, in response to the collapse of, um, of uh, communism, you've got to turn back to the markets again, where you get basically neoliberal theories and liberal neo practice, Washington consensus type of practices, um, practices prior to that even that introduce structural adjustment, um, you know, very negative outcomes resulting from them in very many countries. And so you've got this third kind of backlash to, um, to development theory in the dependency theorists or the third world radical theorists. So basically you have the modernization, you know, kind of classical um, orthodox economic theorists. Then you've got the pushback from the, the state corporatists, actually from both ends, but also particularly from centralized planning, um, communist kind of sense when those collapsed, and even before that, you've got a pushback from third world theorists, dependency theorists, who said, in fact, neither of these are working very much, and this whole modernization development stuff is all nonsense, and we must actually fo focus much more on you know, underdevelopment, colonialism, the legacies of colonialism, and that kind of thing, and just, just discarded dependency on. And then <coughs> that was kind of happening during my um, intellectual development, and so that was what I believed and thought for a long time. That's why I distanced myself from development theory through the uh, Washington Consensus and post-Washington Consensus period. But as I said, I think um, there, is, there is something to be said um, for it. So essentially what we're trying, if we, if we concern that um, this development theory now um, is uh, we need to try, we're basically looking at transformation, we need to look at what we're trying to transform. And essentially if you look at what development um, literature and development theory and practice, some practice, is grappling with now. It's really how to understand and challenge authority, how to shift incentives from incentives that were, you know, um, in inducing underdevelopment or, or not development. Um, accountability systems, that's really what we, we, we're grappling with. How do we make communities, individual states, markets, um, you know, apps producers, internet.org, whoever it is, how do we make them um, accountable? Um, what governing institutions are going to make sure that this development happens? 
if we look at the, um, e essentially what we're doing with development theory is looking at the principles that govern political, economic, social, and cultural systems. And that's where this link between um, development and a lot of the research that is going on in computer science or ICT is not, um, is not often there. The other important thing that is critiques of the in the literature at the moment point out is a need to account for local objectives, capacities, endowments of society. So again, I'm giving very broad sweeps of things, but you know, basically the acknowledgement that you can't simply take you know, advanced capitalist societies, um, institutions and practices and impose them on developing countries and hope that you are going to, you know, in a linear way, just produce um, advanced <laughs> industrialized capitalist countries. Um, so really what, what, what development is dealing with is essentially this transition from um, unindustrialized or semi-industrialized or partially industrialized societies and often very mixed, so that makes it more complicated, um, towards more um, developed uh, societies. Um, okay, so we've, we've basically covered that, but you could look at that a bit more closely if you wanted to remind yourselves of those three main um, schools. So as I said, basically what, we, what we're grappling with with development at the moment, and I think in terms of linking your research projects, this is essentially what we need we see in the literature is that um, essentially the development community is managing um, these underlying processes, the underlying processes of these, this global economic system that's emerged based in the globalization period of the last 20 or 30 years, although it obviously goes on much earlier than that. Um, intensified interdependence, okay, so no matter, you know, all attempts, whether it was, you know, under, under communist or Soviet Union um, economic policies, or whether it was under China economic, China's economic policies, or whether it was under um, South African apartheid economic policies, or whatever it was, any societies that continue to try and isolate them, themselves and simply operate as old nation states are simply unable to do so. Um, so there's this intensified um, interdependence um, between states, between markets, between individuals. Um, you know, even the issue that was spoken about um, in terms of internet.org. Um, here we have potentially a country, a, a company from a you know, foreign country opening up um, access to an internet market that other people are criticizing is actually not opening up to the, you know, for the open internet, but it should be allowing smaller companies to compete, etc. So these are all connected. The arguments in favor or against are all linked because we're now so interdependent. And then the other thing which I think really distinguishes um, development theory and practice today from you know, um, political science or political economy or sociology or anthropology or something is that ICT4D is an applied discipline. If, it's, if you're going to call it a discipline, it's an applied study. Um, we're not just talking about the theory. We actually, uh, yeah, that's just development theory. If we're talking ICT4D, we've got to deal with um, the realities of um, transforming societies, and generally these are conflict-ridden um, prescriptions that we have to make in order to, um, from a policy perspective or something, in order to achieve outcomes, are invariably um, disrupted by un you know, unanticipated events. Um, you know, and I'll speak a bit, hopefully, um, well, maybe not, but very quickly you know, about these complex adaptive systems that we're in that make managing this environment that we're in extremely challenging on the one hand, but actually also full of enormous potential on the other because of its you know, nature, because of the complex adaptive nature of the internet, etc. The possibilities of um, using capacities that exist in different parts of this system um, instead of your traditional you know, layered markets and states and you know, consumers and that sort of thing um, is, is, is enormous. The potential for that is enormous. Um, so just important to, as I said, to understand that as ICT4D, we, we're in a global context. Although we're going to be implementing, we're going to be um, you know, uh, working in a particular community. I've been lovely work going on in Western Cape in you know, working in the Eastern Cape on getting connectivity projects going and that kind of thing. But the, the, that connection, although it's a connecting natural village, it's a fabulous localized village connection project, it's connecting to the global um, 
you know, internet, the global net, if that's going to um, offer that value to, to people. Um, so basically we see the end of this exclusiveness of nations, 